and welcome to episode 74 of The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the casual spike, focused on the latest decks, trends, strategies, and streamers in Modern and Pioneer. My name is Stanislav here in Chicago, and with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's the one and only Shane Beeps. Stanislav, how are you, my friend? Good to see you yet again. Always, always a pleasure. Another week. We made it. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I survived a small flood. Yeah, I heard Chicago was mad. It was it was angry. It was weeping. It was sad on Sunday, that's for sure. Also with us, the Godfather, Dave Harbarger. I'm here. I'm going to mulligan on my uh, my day today, but the, this is going to be a good podcast. So, and returning this week, first guest to return for the third time, friend of the show, Everett Mohan, or as you may know him, aspiring Spike. That's me. What's up, man? Thanks for coming back. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. I like being on. It's a good time. Clearly, we like having you on. Stay tuned, listeners, for the uh, Tribal Council at the end of this episode where we figure out who we vote off the island so Everett can stay permanently. <laughs> there can only be three of us, so. You guys like Survivor? That was a topical reference, right? <laughs> St Dave, I've never seen a single episode. I haven't either. I just know the Tribal Council's a thing. It, it's a great show for People interested in game design and puzzles, I hear. Hmm. What do I know about that stuff? On this week's episode, we break down the results from the weekend's Lotus Box Modern 1K. Then we dive into companions and consider strategies for playing against them, brewing in the current metagame, and why we believe Umari the Collector is hands down the best magic card of all time. Easily, easily. I saw one cast today. I saw one cast Did today. Did you really? Yeah, on Fran Francisco's stream, uh, he was playing Imori Primeval Titan, and and it didn't look bad. It didn't look bad. It didn't look good either, but it didn't look bad. <laughs> well, just last week, Shane and I were on the Modern Streamers League, and we saw a couple Titan matchups, and we were wondering whether Titan can fit any companion, and now we know the answer. Yeah, yeah. The, it can fit the worst companion and uh, still be a really good deck. It's hey, still a four mana, four or five, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, better than Pelucranos. Maybe when Pelucranos rotates, it'll uh, it'll see some play. I remember when I just wanted to play Urnum Jin because it was a four mana, four or five. So we've, we've come a long way. Have come a long way. But first, some housekeeping. Shout out to new patron, possibly returning patron, Rogue IRL. Hello. Also, Andrew. Jason W. and Khan K. Welcome. Welcome, new citizens. Also, big thanks to John N. for increasing their Patreon support. Also means a lot to us. Thank you very much. And some special shout-outs to Master... <laughs> Master B. Mossy B or something. Yeah. Mossy thanks B or something. Thanks, thanks for the nice review. <laughs> I really got to read these review names before we record. Yeah. Hey, I put in, I'll put in a little note, okay? Just a reminder, the Dive Down is a family-friendly podcast. Share it with your friends. And if you'd like to join the Dive Down Nation and get access to our super secret Slack channel and server, many channels, uh, you can find us at patreon.com slash the Dive Down. And uh, we appreciate the support. Totally understand in these trying times that people may not be able to support us. We will be here either way. So, uh... We love you. We'll be here next week and the week after and stuff. Uh, hang in there. We're also brought to you in part by Mana Traders. Uh, they rent cards to us. They rent cards to you. Uh, playing on Magic Online. Everyone's doing that a lot more these days. There's a lot of online tournaments, a lot of online fun to be had. So if you would like to get 15% off your first three months of renting Magic Online cards, you can use sign up code the dive down, all one word at Mana Traders. Dot com and it helps us out a little bit and saves you some cash. Yeah, and with all that out of the way, we got some breaking news from Monday. So I guess this news broke five days ago. Yeah, is, that, is it still breaking if it's been five days? You know, there are some people who probably haven't heard. But we have a new BNR announcement that does not actually impact the formats that we talk about on this show. Well, let's go over this in depth. Can't wait. Yeah, so... They had to do with Brawl, Legacy, and Vintage. And in Legacy, some companions were banned. In Vintage, a companion was banned. 
And we don't typically talk about bannings in other formats, but the only reason we bring them up is because there was a very important message included with this BNR. The message is Luris is so messed up that it's the first card banned in vintage yes. since 1996. The first, oh, there was a, there was a previous banning, like full out banning. Mind twist, according to Todd Anderson's article that was on uh, Star City Games, was banned in 1996. Shout uh, out to friend of the pod, <clears throat> Todd. Yes. But uh, yeah, nothing been banned in vintage in like 20 years until Luris came along. Yeah, restriction doesn't really do much in vintage, right? I mean, for a companion. Yeah, not when you're only going to play one anyway, so... Yeah, and we should clarify that Luris was banned in Vintage. It was also banned in Legacy alongside Zerda the Dawnmaker. Yeah, that one really surprised me. I mean, Luris didn't surprise me, but Zerda did. I haven't played a ton of Legacy lately, but I kind of was under the impression the consensus was if you saw a Zerda, you were able to mulligan to interaction usually for it. Uh, and I have been told by a lot of people who liked the Zerda deck initially that they just kept losing with it. Um, so I, I was surprised to see it on the ban list, but I think this is an example of Wizards seeing the actual win percentage of these decks and knowing something that we don't know because we don't have all the information. And alongside these bannings, they also posted a couple short paragraphs about what their thoughts were on the companions in other formats. They wrote it. I'm just going to read it real quick, and then we can talk about it briefly. Wizards writes... While this set of changes has focused on legacy, vintage, and brawl, we're continuing to watch the evolution of the metagame in each other format, including standard, pioneer, and modern. Hey, that's us. If changes become needed in other formats, we'll provide those separately in a future announcement. As of now, we're seeing diverse and dynamic metagame that changes from week to week in each standard, pioneer, and modern. Real quick, does that check out with what you guys are seeing online? Diverse, dynamic metagames? I'm not one to speak for standard, but that is my impression of standard from people that I respect. And I do think that's actually the case in Pioneer and Modern. I don't think that's really what, you know, what, what I'm experiencing, what I'm hearing other people say, it feels like just a total disconnect. But, but this is actually how I feel. I really feel like Modern and Pioneer is evolving and diverse and fun. Dave, Shane, have you guys been playing Magic? I know of it. No, I mean, I, 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 I've I, seen... My exposure to Magic right now is such that there's a lot of companion decks, but I think people are still playing what they think is good and interesting. And the tournament meta that we see, the deck list and such, we do see new tech, we see new decks. And yeah, I agree with... Everett, I mean, he has more exposure to the gameplay, but for sure, I think we're seeing continued evolution. Um, it just involves a lot of the cards that we're going to be talking about this episode. I'm going to hold my comments for later. Let's let's go through our, our content this week and then have a little chat at the end of it about how we're feeling. They add, before determining whether any changes are necessary and what the right changes would be, we need to see the metagame come closer to an equilibrium state Currently, these formats are shifting too quickly for data to indicate what, if any, card or archetype poses a problem. That equilibrium state comment is very interesting to me, but... The data's moving too fast. We can't track it. <laughs> too many zeros and ones. We are aware of some players' concerns about the frequency at which they encounter decks using the companions across several formats. And I highlighted this part because I feel like this is very important. While we're not currently seeing problematic win rates in Standard, Pioneer, or Modern from decks using Companions, we are looking at overall metagame share and potential for repetitive gameplay. If we see signs of long-term health issues resulting from high metagame share of Companion decks, we're willing to take steps up to or including changing how the me Companion mechanic works. Hmm. Lots of digest, lots of digest there. Yeah. I'll tell you what, my gut reaction as far as fixing companion goes is that I do think they should, con should consider changing the mechanic itself. And maybe there's more to come for us to discuss on that later on as we talk about individual cards, since this whole episode, of course, is companion centric. Uh, but top line, I think that seems like a fair thing to consider doing. While it would be unprecedented, uh, I think it's, I'm glad to hear that they think it's on the table. Yeah, we're in unprecedented times with magic. 
I, I do think it's, it's definitely unprecedented, but at the same time, Companion is pretty unique in that it seems like one of the few mechanics that you could actually, that you could actually errata. Uh, you know, it's, you know, there's not reminder text printed on any of the cards saying how the Companion mechanic works. So just changing how it works, I really think would be a pretty smooth transition. And I think that's kind of, that's kind of rare for something like this. So got kind of lucky, I think. Totally agree. Yeah. So I feel like we're talking a lot about companions already, and we're going to be doing this later. So, Dave, are you you taking us? You going taking? You're on the news desk this week. I am on the news desk this week. So let's hop into our patent pending breakdown section to talk about the Lotus Box League Series Modern tournament from this weekend. Ever did you play in this tournament? Uh, I did not play in this one. I played in a couple of them. I took this weekend off. Um, but I do like that they're doing this. I think we're all thirsty for tournaments, and it's really cool that they've set this up. Yeah, I'm super impressed with these guys as far as just kind of like the level of polish that they put into it. I haven't played in one of the events because it's really hard for me to do a daytime event with my kids and stuff. I'm very much a magic night owl, as has been established on the show. But um, I, I'm, it's the fact that they managed to get this together, that they've had the interest and the coverage, I think is really interesting and impressive. I like the tournament rules. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, Lotus Box uses this platform called mtgmelee.com to organize mm-hmm. these events, which is also the platform we use to do our Dive Down Nation internal tournaments. Well, can we can we just give a shout out to uh, Ben, who actually ran this? Yeah, our event, not he, not the Lotus Box tournament, our internal tournament. He's run a couple now. Yes, thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Ben. But the reason I bring it up is not only to shout out Ben, but also this mtgmelee.com website is very cool. And I think it's a nice way to organize, you know, DIY tournaments that you can even look into to do with your friends at home or wherever your friends may be. So something to check out. Perfect. So just in case people aren't familiar with the series, basically it is a four week series. It's every couple of weeks they're doing one of these tournaments and each week is a different format. They've gone standard. They went pioneer. This week was modern. People are prepping for legacy uh, in a couple of weeks here. And at the end, they're going to do an invitational based on the people who have done the best across the entire series. It's a really cool structure, replicates some of the best things about things like Star City Games in a format that's uh, play from home. Uh, It had 212 entrants, which was awesome. There were 1,150 matches of data that Lotus Box was nice enough to share with everybody on a Reddit post that we will link in the show notes. Please go and check them out. Support them if you like the content here. They did a lot of the legwork. We're just going to be reacting to their work, to be honest. So first thing I thought we could do was take a look at the popular decks and their win rates. I thought what we should do is talk about the most popular decks with win win rates above 50% on on the tournament this weekend. So the first thing that was super interesting to me was that we have two sort of new decks at the top of this metagame. The first most popular deck with 26 pilots was Teamer Scape Shift, I guess is what you could call it. And it's a Yorian deck. Basically, it's kind of like a Bant Control-ish list. It's got Uro and Ice Fang Coatl and stuff like that with a kind of all I win button, as CCR called it in the post, with Scape Shift and Valakut as a combo finish. It also leverages Bring to Light as a bit of a tutor in the in the deck. It's got a bunch of good blinking targets, some old s- staples of ramp combo strategies like Remand as a four of. Is it Charm is in this deck? Growth Spiral, Lightning Bolt. It's a lot of kind of like weird, I mean, great spells, but kind of like a new shell for all of them to be in together. Um, I haven't played with this deck quite yet, but it's interesting that it seems like it came a little bit out of nowhere to be the most popular deck in this particular tournament this weekend. Yeah, Everett, what's your exposure to this deck? Have you been seeing it for a few weeks? Is it kind of newer? Um, I think it's been popping in and out for like the last two weeks, I'd say. I believe that it won a PTQ uh, recently. Not the... I can't remember which one it was. It wasn't uh, It wasn't the one that I won recently. Um, but also Gabriel <laughs> Deceif has been... I mean, yeah. It wasn't the one I won because I won that one. (laughs) (laughs) On on a totally different deck. Uh, We can talk about that later. But uh, Gabriel Deceive has been picking it up and tuning it. And I think the deck is just very good. Um, It's certainly my impression that the deck is great. I I think that we're seeing Yorion decks 
and decks that have a hard time fitting all the tutor targets they want to fit in anyways tend to go hand in hand. Like these Valakit um, team or decks have always struggled to fit, you know, enough lands to kill your opponent with Valakit and then have a functional mana base for your blue cards. And so, but so if you just play 30, you know, six lands, however many lands this deck is playing, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but you can fit all of your, all of the lands you want to play and have enough fetches to get them, which is really, really powerful. And obviously you get Yorion, which is just a super powerful card. Uh, I think this deck is, is great. And I, I, I can, I would see it being a player going forward. That's a fascinating thing that I did not think about when looking at this list is that, yeah, sometimes you run out of mountains. Right. And so this deck, just because of Yorion, gets to play enough lands to have the extra mountains. You also get the Triome, which is a which is a mountain and makes the mana so much smoother. You also play Arkham's Astrolabe, which makes the mana smoother and it, that synergizes with Yorion. And I think that was always Teamer Scapeshift's biggest weakness is you're a deck that's trying to put a bunch of mountains into play. And you also want to hold up blue counter spells, you know, notably your triple blue cryptic command. So that was the most popular deck this week. It had a 56.17 uh, win percentage, which is reasonably high. I think yeah, most people would say. Fair. Yeah. All right. The number two deck on this list from the number of pilots, uh, also a fascinating brew, and that is what is essentially Rakdos Prowess. Okay. Yeah, this deck rules. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a deck with 21 pilots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a great ba- band. Is that a band? That's a band, <laughs> right? So. Okay. So it had 21 <laughs> pilots in this in this event. It also had a 60.94% win percentage. Which somehow. is great, which is very, very good. Yeah, that's yeah. super yeah. high, right? Um, that's high enough that it remained, if it remained consistent for too long a period of time, wizards might act. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about this deck. So it put three players into the top four of the tournament, though it lost in the finals to Ad Nauseam. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it's a really interesting twist on a shell that I think a lot of us are familiar with. I, I, Everett, I don't know if you've, I've seen you talk about playing kind of aggro-ish lists like this very much, but it's definitely kind of like D- Stan and I tend to spend a lot of time playing Prowess for some reason. I guess it's easy to pick up and come back to when it's good and things like that. So, I mean, I, I, I love playing the Prowess decks. Um, I know that it showed up on, on Moto about seven to 10 days ago starting to get popular. So the twists and turns compared to the original prowess and the Boros prowess deck. That's also gotten popular lately with Luris. Of course, this deck has Luris as a companion, by the way, I should note that right away. Um, it cuts way back on the burn and focuses on disruption. Instead, there's no lava spike. There's no lava dart. There's no lava anywhere in this deck. Uh, it's got three lightning bolts and three seals of fire. You know, everybody's all up on the uh, synergy between Luris and seal of fire. Uh, it's got ways to recur threats via Luris, but also Coligan's Command and some Unearth in the sideboard. I, you know, I've talked a couple of times after playing with Luris decks here and there. I do often think that the ones that I feel the best about are the ones that have a way to get Luris back out of the graveyard if it dies. Uh, maybe that's not 100% true all the time, but I feel best playing decks like that. And then, of course, it's got cantripping, recurring main deck graveyard hates in four crumble to dust which is a cling to dust oh cling to dust yeah that's a different card my bad uh yeah and cling to dust is an instant that costs a black mana and it says exile target card from a graveyard if it was a creature card you gain three life if it was or otherwise draw a card and then it has escape three generic and a black exile five other cards from your graveyard so definitely a way to fire up some prowess triggers get rid of somebody else's luris from the graveyard the instant speed uh, kind of helps with that. This is a card that I had a little bit of an eye on during our spy- spoiler app, just because it's one mana and says draw a card on it and an instance. Um, and then it has discard instead of burn, essentially. And so it has two Thought Seas, two uh, Inquisition and Kozilek main, and four Crow Brew in the sideboard. So you can do a lot to spells decks if you want to. You know, so what's this deck? Like, a, typically you'd say, like, a deck like this is trying to go under some of the bigger strategies, but the disruption element isn't going face. So what do you think this is trying to disrupt? Why is it valued? Why is it valuing disruption over damage? So my impression, impression of this deck, and you know, I'm certainly not, you know, the, the mono red King, but I believe that this Rakdos version is emerging to 
beat up on the mirror. We saw the Boros deck be really popular. Yama Killer um, really you know championing the Boros Prowess deck and cling to dust, collective brutality, the interactive spells uh, just go a little above the, what the Boros deck is doing and give you a huge edge against that version. And you know, I think that's also why we're not seeing Lava Dart. It's because Lava Dart's not very good in the mirror. And, you know, this Rakdos Prowess deck is still very good at beating up at what the Boros deck is good at beating up. The big mana strategy is going really fast, um, but it's just good against the Boros version. And I think that's why we're seeing this deck be so popular. Um, the, the, the Prowess deck is also just kind of hard to evaluate because while it can kill very quickly, it's also a deck that's good at grinding and drawing cards and interacting with burn spells. So while the discard spells looked pretty strange to me at first, I, I've, they, they're, they're growing on me. I think that they're, they give you like a pretty versatile game plan. I think this deck is really cool. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I definitely thought it was fascinating to see kind of another direction emerge for the prowess core that's essentially like uh, Soulscar Mage, Swift Spear, and Manamorphose as the core of decks that go in lots of different directions, right? So we see the mono red one that was around historically for a long time, then the Boros one, then this one. You know, occasionally you get into the kind of super aggro zoo version where you're playing things like um, mutagenic growth and stuff like that to really go hyper. Occasionally you see like a blue red version. So I, I think it's cool to just sort of have prowess assert itself as a pillar of a whole universe of decks and this is just sort of like a new version of it and it's certainly not a version that i ever expected to see be appropriate in the metagame but i'm glad somebody found it yeah it kind of reminds me of the time when is it phoenix started playing main deck surgical extraction but it's an entire deck around that principle of beating mirror games and attacking a very specific meta there's an interesting interaction too between the hand disruption and then the uh, cling to dust, because you can sort of pick and choose what you exile. So if something has recursion or something has some value in the graveyard or you want to gain some life or draw a card, you can sort of set up your cling to dusts there, which I like. It's a good point. So the third place deck in this one, this was a deck with 51.11% uh, win rates 15 pilots and that is bogles boggles whichever way you like to say it just listen to that clip um third most popular deck it's back uh, yeah i mean it's back i think that part of it is i th i think this deck is pretty good against prowess and so i feel like this is another kind of attempt at people to kind of metagame uh, against a prowess heavy field and, you know, this deck is running Luris as well to be able to recur the threats that you need to. The nice thing that you can do with Luris is bring back enchant buffs or creatures, depending on what you kind of need on a given hand. So um, I think it's pretty interesting. The Lotus Box's data, matchup data, which they were also really nice to share, says that, for example, this deck was 38% against the Scape Shift decks and 66% against the Rakdos Prowess decks. So it seems like people who are trying to do this against Prowess probably made a reasonable decision. It's interesting that it was... You know, this is clearly looks like a metagame deck. Like when, when Bogles becomes more popular, it's it's always like an, it's typically in response to the meta, right? And so the players on Bogles predicted this; they wanted to play Bogles, but the the people on Rakdos Prowess, I think by and large, the lists I was looking at, they don't have any like sacrifice effects. Do you know what I mean like this is something that could easily like next week we are going to be seeing uh, Rakdos Prowess have some sideboard sacrifice effects. Yeah, or, or engineered explosives, uh, which goes pretty good with Luris. Uh, but you know, one card that John the mid range decks aren't playing anymore is Liliana of the Veil, and uh, because they're you know playing it playing Luris instead, and that's a card I sorely miss. I uh, I miss casting that card. Could you imagine a prowess deck just being like, I'm bringing Liliana out of the sideboard? <laughs> that would be that would be something. I don't need Luris. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that I thought it was really interesting that all the lists that I saw from Bogles ha did not have Mishra's Bauble. So they were not trying to grind out like card drawing. They were just using Luris to get back their permanents, basically, which is interesting. I, I'm i pretty sure Bogles, Bogles is the worst Luris deck in modern. You just have a deck that's turning off your opponent's creature removal, and you just have a threat that, you know, is a pretty poor play into uh, creature removal. 
I mean, it's pretty free to play. I think it's correct to play. But out of all the Luris decks, I feel like Luris and Boggles is probably the least impactful. Do you think it's worse than my Cat Tribal deck that uses Luris? Or uh, that that deck sounds great. There's another companion that could play uh, Cat Tribal too. So you've got your pick of the litter, I, if you will. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, I'm going to go through the last few pretty quickly. So the next on the list uh, in popularity was Tron with 14 pilots at 54%. Yes. Wow. Track. Tron's being Tron. I kind of felt... Well, here, here's my take. It felt like people are starting to pay a lot of attention to Luris, and so they're packing a lot of graveyard hate. And so Tron is not super vulnerable to that. And so if people are shaving land hate for graveyard hate, maybe there's a little opening for Tron to come back. Again, I'm not... I'm You know, this is, you know... 40 year old magic dad <laughs> metagame advice podcast. i don't know what you think Everett, but uh that was kind of I, my impression. I, I agree i also think that the tron decks are good against every single fair luris deck or sorry mid-rangey uh but it's not very good against the prowess deck which is kind of why i'm not sure that it's a great metagame percentage or a metagame call just because it seems to be bad against the best deck but it seems to be good against everything else do you think it's bad against this pro against this prowess deck too like because this one's a little slower right i think it's not I think it's probably better against Rakdos Prowess than Boros because the Rakdos deck is slower, but I think that Rakdos is still probably favored. And in the list I was looking at, a lot of the Tron decks were sort of doing that Tron thing where they're having like main deck, like swag tusks and things like that. So like they have a little bit more life gain built into the deck and like some some smaller, lower to the ground, like smaller in terms of Tron uh, cards that can be cast maybe a turn earlier or something like that. Sounds good to me. It sounds correct to to build your Tron deck like that. What do you all think about Gigantha out of the sideboard uh, in most of these decks? It's just another free roll kind of, right? Like you can't even use the activated ability for anything. So yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah, I think Gigantha, Kihira, cards that are just kind of there, companions that are just kind of there, they, they're certainly nice to have. But in my experience playing with and against them, I think they're just not very impactful. They do one really nice thing is that they do in some ways reduce the amount of non-games and magic. You've, you're going to flood out less often when you just have this extra spell to play. And maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but or I'm getting a little ahead of, <laughs> of us. But I think that's that was the intention behind the companion mechanic is to reduce the amount of non-games inherently built into magic because Flood and Screw exists. Um and uh, I think that Jingatha in this deck, Jingatha in like Blue Red Storm, I think that's what it's there for. And I like it. I think it's actually healthy to have. Interesting. Run us through these next list, Dave. Yeah. So the, the last few decks on this list that were above 50%, Amulet Titan with nine pilots only just kind of like squeaking into the top 10 as far as most popular decks go. I mean, there were nine pilots, but three of them made the top 32 with this deck and it, it kind of felt to me like maybe it's similarly positioned to Tron in some ways, less, less land hate equals an opportunity for them to come back. You know, I'm not a Titan player. So understanding why someone would choose to go Titan list Titan sort of with scape shift versus this deck within the confines of a metagame is kind of hard, but um, you know, Amulet's still here, put up 54, 54% win rate. That's, that's pretty good. The best, the best Titan players are always going to win with Titan. I, I feel like Amulet Titan is a deck that just re really rewards you for knowing it inside and out. And I, I love to see decks like that. I love to see just masters always be able to crush. And I, I kind of think that's what this is. I think Amulet Titan is just always going to be able to put up good numbers because the good players are always going to win with it. Yeah, and there's certainly a lot of Amulet people involved in the universe of Lotus Box players, right? So it shouldn't be too much of a surprise to see some people register it. Uh, Devoted Devastation had six pilots with a 52% win rate. Recur your combo pieces with Luris, bring them back. Not much to say there, but it's definitely still making, making an impression. Bant Snowblade had a 56% win rate. It had six pilots and two were in the top 32. Their Yorian decks, I mean, weirdly to me, or maybe not that weirdly, they kind of look like the Team Escape Shift decks in some ways with, you know, they have the same core Simic cards. They just have different kind of end games, right? One of them is trying to go down the Stoneforge Mystic route. The other one is like, I want a combo finish. But the core of the deck, the value that the, the deck derives from the companion and a lot of the cards in it is kind of the same. I'm also willing to bet real actual money that zero out of six stone blade snow blade decks actually had stoneforge mystic or a sword 
I thought they did. I might be wrong. There's always one guy. There's always yeah. one guy. Yeah, you think that they're just they're just the band Snow Control. You're probably yeah. I think you're right. They're just the band. They're just the band. They're just playing the band list. Okay. And then finally, two pure combo decks were at or above 50%. Six players were on Adnaz and four were on Gift Storm. Uh, and uh, both maintained around 50%. Adnaz was actually the winner. Um, seems like the way that this metagame is going right now, pure combo has a place to live. Uh, for me, Ad nauseum seemed like it had some space again because of the the um, graveyard hate thing. It's not particularly vulnerable to graveyard hate. And from what I understand, Ad nauseum is supposed to be good against the prowess decks. Um, it's supposed to just be able to buy a ton of time with uh, Phyrexian Unlife, Angel's Grace. It, honestly, that wasn't my impression uh, of, of how the matchup would go, but that's just what I keep hearing over and over again from people I respect, and I, I think it's probably true. Yeah, the winner of this tournament is a Twitch streamer. Uh, they actually reached out to us. It's you can find them on Twitch at Donking Ryan, D O N K I N G Ryan. Did they hear that we were talking about doing an amulet or yeah, not an Adnaz dive down? They, you know what, word travels fast, Dave. That's and the funny. Adnaz community got really excited that we floated that idea last week. Oh boy! All right. Well, you know they call it a tease in the industry. Will do your deck fairly poorly compared to how you would play it, but at least we'll be talking yeah, about we'll it. We'll spend an hour generating content that makes you go, ah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So the majority of decks within the metagame were still featuring companions. 129 out of 212 decks registered for this event had companions. 71 were Luris, 44 were Yorian, 7 Gigantha, 4 Garuda, 2 Obosh, and 1 Kahira. It's a lot of, it's a lot it's of a lot. Luris. Yeah. I mean, it's 33.5% is, is Luris by my math. And uh, 60% of the decks overall had compa- had companions. So um, yeah, that's why we're talking about it this week, right? You got to think about them, got to know what to do with them because they're there, especially Luris and Yorian. So let's just go through the top eight real quick. As we mentioned, Brian Donkin on Ad Nauseam won this. Uh, we'll see what happens in the near future for us playing some ad nauseum. Uh, Nathan Stoyer was on Rakdos Aggro featuring Luris, as was Abraham Stein and Carolyn Kavanaugh to round out the top four. So three more Rakdos Aggro decks, as we mentioned there, Rakdos Prowess. Wasn't Carolyn in the top eight of the uh, Pioneer 1K two weeks ago? I think she's so. killing it. Yeah, she's towards the top of the leaderboard in total points I saw as well. Uh, and then Steven, Steven Dickman on Boggles with Luris in sixth place. Breek Groger on Teamer Urian. Trevor Harris on Devoted Devastation. And Patrick Narvisage on Teamer Urian. So we had two Teamer Urian, a Boggles, three Rakdos, an Ad Nauseum, and a Devoted Devastation. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So the main takeaways from this tournament for me... Anyway, and anybody else, feel free to throw their <laughs> thoughts in here. But the, the headline for me here is just companions. Know what to do with them. Think about them all the time. Pay attention to them. Talk about them on Twitter because that's what magic's about right now. And that's what the, this episode's about. Anybody else have any thoughts about takeaways from this tournament? Well, I think it was interesting. We didn't see anything that was like completely overpowering representation. Like, like in the days of... Uh, you know, is it Phoenix, something like that? We'd see up to, up to 20% representation in a tournament. We're only seeing like 12 here, you know, 12, 10, seven, six, six, five, four. Like, so there's people are playing, a still a decent number of different strategies. Um, and they don't even all involve companions. Like there's still a lot of adult Eldrazi Tron players. There's Tron players who aren't running, uh, Jengatha, there's there's certainly room for a number of decks, but we did kind of see some some tier one separating itself. Yeah, it it also feels like the prowess deck, the team or scapeshift deck, these feel like strategies that the meta can easily adjust to. They don't seem like they're gonna be strategies that will be dominant forever. Or bogles. Or nah, bog <laughs> that's here to stay. Bogles <laughs> yeah. Tier zero. That's what the metagame revolves around. 
Yeah, I wonder if this observation you're making, Shane, wherein we don't have a single deck homogenizing the format has to do with the fact that both Luris and Yorion are amazing, and you can't put them in the same deck, and they almost exist as a foil to one another. I I honestly agree completely, and I I feel like I don't I don't know if I really believe this, but there's a part of me that thinks that maybe Yorion and, and Luris are just these necessary evil that makes magic really, really fun and interactive and good and skill intensive and diverse, but they just show up in every single game. I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, companions have been out for a little over a month now and I'm still having a super hard time evaluating them. It's, they're really, really weird. They're really, really good. And, you know, magic is uh, going through a weird time right now, but it's a good time, I think. So let, let's scrap the rest of the episode we had prepared and let's just let's just talk about companions for a while maybe in the dive down oh yeah well, but i did all that work on the ad nos dive down well I'll just save that for another week okay all right that wraps up the breakdown for this week we're going to take a quick break and when we return we're diving into our new friends who we have to love no questions asked gotta love me it's companion week on the dive down stay with us And we're back to part 44 of our 444-part series on the Companions of Magic the Gathering. 9% done. (laughs) Getting there. One episode at a time. Um, So this week, we wanted to get Everett on because, as you know, Aspiring Spike plays a lot of magic, does really well at magic, and... Ever, you are a known metagamer, known brewer. So we thought what we would do is talk about companions, kind of talk about what's going on with them, why they're good, and how you are responding to them. And yeah, and of course, the other thing is that, you know, Ever recently put out that sweet counterbalance list and won a PTQ with it to return the Pro Tour. So we wanted to have him on just to congratulate him for that because the prize that everybody wants in the PTQ is to have to do a podcast with us. It's the press tour that follows. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's It was in the Magic Online thing, say, so go on the dive down if you win it. So Immediately. It's yeah, it's, yeah, it's when you open up one of the chests, you get a ticket that says, call Shane. <laughs> I was ecstatic. I was ecstatic. That's funny. Yeah, but I mean, that deck was just such a great example. And we're going to get to it in a minute, but such a great example of metagaming and so just wanted to talk with someone who's done that many, many times over the last uh, just time that we've been watching him. Because like we talked about earlier, this is a format that seems rather condensed around the power level of companions. But as we see from week to week, there's still a lot of room for learning, for changing, for experimenting, and for responding to the meta. So what I wanted to do first is kind of talk about the current metagame pretty briefly. Um, we, you know, we, of course, we just talked a lot about the the modern 1K. Yeah, and a reminder, 60% of decks had companions, 33.5% had Luris, 40% did not have companions. So let's talk about Pioneer, though, because, you know, this is a Pioneer in, in modern pods. So let's, let's I want to breeze through some stats from recent leagues and recent competitions. So the league from the 18th, 31 decks, 31 separate decks. 20 Yorion, 6 Luris, 2 Garuda, 1 Obosh, 1 Zerda, 1 non-companion deck out of 31 in a league. The league on the 14th, 2 with no companions. The league on the 11th, 4 with no companions out of 29. Recent competitions. On the 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 May 16th challenge, 4 non-companion decks in the top 32. Are these non-companion decks always Lotus Breach, or is there a variety there? I think they're frequently Lotus Breach, and is what's is there, are there other combo decks in in Pioneer that I'm forgetting? Well, ever? there's Inverter, but a lot of those are playing Yorion now. I'm honestly not convinced that's correct because I kind of think the version that doesn't play Yorion is favored in the mirror because they're better at comboing. But I'm not sure. I'm More not efficient sure. at getting to the combo. Yeah. So the 16th challenge only had four non-companions in the top 32, and the 15th super qualifier had three non-companions in the top 32. Almost 
everything we're seeing is is Yorion and Luris, a few Obash, a few uh, Garuda, and maybe a Zerda here and there. So to summarize, even including non-tournament metagame, out of the last 151 decks, we have 14 without companions. That's less than 10% of decks in pioneer yeah i mean that that is mixing results a little bit we know this don't send us letters some of those are top 32s where we're seeing frequency based results and other ones are ones where they're groomed for league results but mm -hmm. still it's just it's it's a it's a weird it's a weirdly shaped cross section yeah come with shane on this magical journey um so yeah we see jeskai super friends we see azorius devotion we see demir inverter we see burn we see rally we see feather in modern, I think you got a good picture of the metagame. Uh, in a recent super qualifier, there was uh, 13 non-companions in the top 32. So it's about maybe the 40% that we've been seeing. Uh, in the 16th challenge, however, out of the top 32, four non-companions. So the modern meta, Luris Burn, Luris Jund, Gruul Obosh, Yorion Bant, uh, this Yorion scape shift that is appearing, the Rakdos aggro that we're seeing, you know, even Tron's getting in on the Jengatha game just because. And you know, former tier one staple decks like Eldrazi Tron, Amulet Titan are kind of looking like tier two, tier 2.5 even in terms of the representation, not necessarily the power level. So, yeah, we all get it. We get it. Companions mostly rule these formats right now, especially if you're a Pioneer fan. Like the, the stats are, are pretty staggering in terms of the representation of companion decks. So I have much like um, last week, I believe, I believe it was last week, I, 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 I framed this in terms of kind of a question and answer, kind of a little round table uh, featuring our better than us guest, Everett. Uh, so the first question I have for you, why has the metagame in both modern and pioneer coalesced around companions? Well, the, the answer is quite simple, Shane. Companions are good. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a pretty nuanced question. I do think Pioneer and Modern are pretty different beasts. So in Modern, you have a lot of linear strategies that can, in some ways, ignore card advantage um, by just playing highly effective tempo-based combo, big mana, graveyard-based strategies. And so... A lot of times in modern, the non-companion decks we're seeing are combo decks. And in Pioneer, we have Demir Inverter, which is mostly transitioning to Yorion Inverter. And we have Lotus Breach, which is the best deck in Pioneer. And uh, is just able to ignore the card advantage that uh, the other decks are generating because they get... Mostly because the deck is just insane, but... Also, just because it, it doesn't care so much about card advantage, it's just trying to kill you on turn four. Love to put a pin in Lotus Breach being the best deck in Pioneer. Maybe we'll come back to that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can come. It's, Love I, that I, statement. I, I think that if you are an expert Lotus Breach player, you probably have one of the best win rates of any formats in Magic right now. Everett, I gotta say, I'm, I'm really sad that the mono green walkers deck seems to have just fallen off a cliff because it can't hang. I've been actually, I uh, played it last week. I think it's good again. I, so Vivian, the new Vivian, we talked about it last time I was on the podcast. I put her in the deck. And so what we've done is we're splashing white and we're playing walking bliss in the main deck. And so the combo is you play, you play one Heliod in the deck. And so you play, you have Vivian protects herself and then if you play Walking Ballista, you play Walking Ballista X equals two. And then you tutor up your Heliod and you put it in play. And then you kill your opponent. And you just play one Heliod. The deck actually feels really good. I want to play it again soon. But I think the deck is strong. No companion. No companion in the deck. Give, give me something to look forward to. Yeah, it's on my Twitter somewhere, I think. I saw that list go by. It was awesome. Yeah. So uh, one thing that I was thinking about, y'all, is, is I kind of summarized it in my brain as like companions are just too powerful and too easy to employ. Like the deck building restrictions are just not that rough. And this is not an original take. I mean, I know that. I, but, I sorry, sorry for interrupting. No, um, please do. But I don't completely agree. I think that Luris and Yorion are too good. I think Luris and, Luria, Luris and Yorion are too pushed. They, their deck building requirements are too easy to jump through and and, you know, in a lot of ways, they keep each other in check. And, you know, the gameplay might be fun and interactive and they might be beatable. Luris and Yorion, I think, are too good. I think every single other companion, except maybe Zerda and Legacy, is fine. I think that's a good check on me. 
ever is because like I think we we kind of lump the concept of companions into the power level of Luris and Yorion and the frequency at which we're seeing those. And so Luris and Yorion are, are crazy. So companions are busted is kind of like what, what people and what I just did. But I think that it's fair to say that not every companion is just so powerful that every deck is going to run some kind of companion. Yeah, there's an old adage. There are no good cards. There's only good. Uh, so there are no good mechanics. There are only good cards. And that's maybe just not true anymore because of companion, but I think that's how you should always look at a card. You should never just like evaluate it based on the mechanic. You should just take every card individually. And I think that people have lumped all the companions together and Kahira did nothing wrong. Kahira did nothing wrong. There, There is the one aspect of it that we're dancing around a little bit or that we haven't talked about head on, which is just the fact that you get the extra card in your hand, you know? And so in in some ways, there's this natural pressure. It's always been my contention while this has gone on for the last month of like, there is pressure to play with an extra card in your hand if you can. Like, and it's really hard to base level, like rational talk about things like card advantage in gaming and things like that to uh, be able to justify not having that extra card in your hand unless you really have a very good reason to not do it. And so I feel like that's like, level one version of why the pressure is pushing towards these cards being all over the place is because you just get an extra resource. And kind of like what I was saying a few weeks ago is that it's not even just one extra card. Like the, the best companions, I think Luris and Yorion generate much greater card advantage than just the extra card. Sure. But let's just talk about why they're coalescing around the, the, the companions themselves. We can talk about those ones later. Cause sure, like sure, Everett sure. said, they're pushed. They are, it's become clear that they're very pushed. I think a lot of people thought that Yorion, there were a lot of people that when they saw Yorion on the spoilers were like, eh, it's a yeah. five drop. But I well, mean, it's more like man, 80 cards. Yeah. More man were people. Yeah. And the 80 card thing, people were like, oh my gosh, we can't do that. But, um, People, I think a lot of initial takes there were very wrong. So, but the question to follow up with here is we all acknowledge that the metagames are coalescing around it, but who's still having fun? Uh, I am. I'm having a lot of fun, actually. I, I thought I'd be sick of companions by now, but I actually genuinely enjoy playing with and against Yorion, like, constantly. And the games are really engaging and skill intensive and reward creative deck building and i i may very well be sick of these cards in a month or two but i'm having a great time and i think a lot of people are too yeah my co-hosts have been kind of hearing me complain a little bit where i was running humans through a league and i just kind of i felt like my decisions weren't mattering so much like like i was making very few decisions i felt in general and the ones that i did make i felt like didn't really have a big impact on the game and i and they were like well shane you need to start maybe looking at control again. You make a lot of decisions. You might not always win, but at least you're making decisions along the way. And I think that's kind of speaking to that, right? Where it's like, you're making a lot of decisions. You feel like your decisions are mattering and the gameplay is interesting. And with the beauty of these Yurion decks is you have 20 more decisions to make every game because your deck is so much thicker. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my to be honest, my experience is only around playing. I've been playing a lot of Luris and a little bit of Obosh. And I've been playing Luris in Shadow or Prowess. And I've been playing Obosh in Ponza. And that's that's pretty much what I've been doing for the last month in Magic. And I still find the games interesting. Um, it's It's a hard square for me to circle, right, this idea that the games are more interactive and interesting because of the presence of companions. And I'd love to like, if, maybe if you could unpack that a little bit more ever, kind of like w why you think that is happening because of these specific cards. Sure. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, Yorion and Luris do inherently lead to interactive gameplay. You know, both are value cards, both are, mid-range cards and it's pretty interesting that Luris tends to lean itself towards cheap one-for-one -one interaction that's the kind of decks that you usually see uh Luris in prowess john grixis um and then the yorion decks are big mid-rangey control decks that usually stomp the the uh the the Luris decks and so 
but they're also inherently kind of weak to the linear strategies because while I think your main deck when you're playing 80 cards is not diluted in power very much, I think most 80 card decks are actually close in power level to a 60 card deck and consistency. Where I think the the 80 card decks suffer is their sideboard. Uh, the London Mulligan was one of the biggest buff to sideboard cards ever because you can just very consistently find Leyline, Stony Silence, Force of Negation. But in your 80 card deck, you can't do that consistently. And so maybe you play you know, for rest in peace, for timely reinforcements, depending on what you're trying to target. But modern is so diverse that you can't target everything in your Yorion decks. So you are soft to some linear strategies. And that's just why I think, you know, deck building and the format's been interesting because there's just a lot of ways to attack the other decks. And I think that's a big part of it. Like Luris is the type of card and, and some of these Zerda decks also, these Zerda decks in particular, they require the opponent to interact with them to have a chance to compete unlike these yurion decks which are the interactive strategies because they're controlling the game i feel like when you see a Luris, you kind of know that you have to hold a fatal push and a fetch land or a lightning bolt for them or you know hold back your seal of fire if you're in a mirror match obosh too like i feel like obosh is this must kill card on site just because it accrues so much value on its own in the Ponza deck at least, or in some of these mono red decks in Pioneer. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of removal that does not kill Obosh too. So it's, it's kind of like, you really got to think forward if you realize you're playing on someone with that. So I wanted to ask you all the next question, which is, you know, we see, especially in, in Pioneer, I think a little bit more than modern right now, but how is this meta game different than previous metas where we had a few high powered decks at the top if at all. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a, that's a great question. And I think it's a very complicated question. I, I love asking complicated questions. Yeah. What I think is happening is the Luris decks are making one for one answers really, really good. You know, if you play a deck with all, you know, cheap answers and just Luris as your card advantage engine, you're usually able to fight the linear strategies that modern is producing, you know, Infect, Devoted Druid, the Titan decks, re- really whatever. You get to pick your answers and and fight it with the Luris decks and and in some ways also the Yorion decks. And so no longer is Modern about Uros slamming into each other. No longer is it about Urza just being just this crazy four mana spell because the answers got better because of threats, which it was, it was really weird. Usually you see like, it's very strange to see a threat make answers better, but because you always have this threat in your hand, you just get to play more spells. And that's what's making it fun for me, is I like to play really interactive spells. Not everybody enjoys playing the game that way, and that's okay. Everybody likes the game differently. But but that's that's why we're not seeing these decks be so, so dominant, is because answers are better than they used to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost like because all the companions are creatures, you have to have creature removal in your decks. And so you, you have to play decks that interact. It would be a totally different and probably, you know, hypothetically less fun situation. If there was like a companion that wasn't an, an artifact or something where it's like, Oh, now I got to have artifact. Hey, or I can't really interact with this thing, but the cost of having creature removal is low enough and normal. Yeah. I mean, I do think that in that way, and you said this earlier too, Everett, is like, this is sort of what Companion was designed to do as a mechanic. Like, and maybe a little bit they got it right, but people are so mad because it feels so unlike magic in that way to have access to one of your answers. I don't know if we want to talk about this here or later. Well, hold on. Are Companion cards actually answers, right? I feel like you have access to enablers very often, but... You know, you don't ever side in a companion card because it's somehow good in counterplay. Yeah, sorry. I, I meant I meant that. I didn't mean answers. I meant, yeah, enablers or threats. Yeah, Just keeping you honest, Dave. Yeah, totally. I misspoke, so it's totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do think companions were intentionally designed to do what they did. Maybe they're having more of an effect than Wizards wanted them to. But I think they were designed to reduce the number of non-games due to Mana Flood. They were designed to make sure everyone always has something to be doing and they were also probably designed to make answers and creature removal 
better. Yeah, just to get back to Shane's initial question here about how this meta compares to other formats or other meta games in the past. One thing that I'm noticing at least, and this is especially true for modern, I think, is when we had super dominant decks, especially in the last year or two, Hogek and Is It Phoenix come to mind as really good examples of this. We still had these silver bullet sideboard cards that we could potentially mulligan to or count on them to give us a leg up in these matchups. And we don't necessarily have that for companions as a way to deal with this suite of cards. Even though Graveyard Hate is technically good against Luris, it's not good against every Luris deck. And in some of my experiences playing these Luris decks, I never even cast Luris because I won before I got the chance to. And I wonder if that may be part of the frustration that people are feeling. Like, you kind of have to play them, or you just play a deck that has nothing to do with companions, but you can't necessarily try to beat the companion mechanic unless you're running Dragoneth Magistrate, like, specifically. What I think is interesting, and we've kind of we've been speaking around this for sure, is like this isn't a meta game where there is a small suite of best decks. There are some best cards and decks that in, invoke and utilize those cards to a particular power level, and then people are able are actually able to meta game against those strategies, and then people tweak what what they're doing with the best cards. So rather than see like Hogak on top with extremely minor changes or Phoenix on top with extremely minor changes or Titan on top um, week to week, we are seeing a surprising shift using a number of the same cards. Which is, it sounds like if you just said, if you just took that statement, it sounds like a healthy meta game to me. Yeah, it sounds like a health. It sounds like a healthy meta. It's just, I think pe- people, I think are feeling the squeeze on their creativity potentially. I, I I certainly understand the squeeze, and I don't disagree. I like in modern. I think that uh, Luris plus Mistress Bobble was too good. I think one should go. I I don't know which one, but I think one should go. I think we know which one you want to see go. Just given that you've said that you like, yeah, companions. yeah. I, I, I've, I've talked about this on stream. I think Mistress Bobble should go. I I I, I I've talked about this a bunch, but I think the deciding factor for Wizards should be if they know another card like Imri and Luris is about to be printed that could just cast Mistress Bobble from the graveyard every single turn, they should just ban Bobble and then see if Luris is too good. Um, obviously, we don't know that. And I, I, you know, if that's just not the case, I think it's kind of a coin toss. But I think Luris without Bobble would be really interesting. I think the Luris decks would have a hard time outgrinding any other fair strategy. I think John would play Liliana and Bloodbraid Elf again. Um in modern specifically, I think that would be a good change. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one of my question is, would Luris be anywhere near as pervasive without Bauble there just to stick into a bunch of decks with it? I mean, I, I've mentioned this to people on our Slack group before because we've talked about this a bunch, of course, where I kind of said, I think Bauble's on a very short list of cards that are just too easy to abuse. And someday something will come along that truly breaks it. And this might be today, right? It's in the Git probe bucket for me. And I've loved playing with Bobble. I play a ton of Bobble decks and have for the last two or three years. But um, yeah, it might be its time. Everett, I love that you mentioned Emery because Luris absorbs so much of the conversation. And I, I've seen people online sort of clutch their Bobbles as this beloved card that they don't want to see go. And I get that. Like, I think Bobble's a cool card too. But Luris wasn't the first card to abuse Mishra's Bobble. And... You know, I'm not saying it necessarily has to go so that Luris can stay, but it's not like Luris is the only card in modern that can make the most out of Bobble and make Bobble less fair. So what are your all tendencies in a meta game like this? Or perhaps we should say a card pool like this that's informing the meta so strongly. Like, do you typically try to get a, an edge by playing what you consider to be the best deck or are you thinking like I'm looking for counters? I'm looking for a way to to attack this meta game by doing something a little bit different, or bring in a particular suite of cards or something like that. Well, me personally, you know, I've sort of kind of uh, just become a brewer in the last year. That wasn't necessarily what I used to be at Magic, but it it is now. It's what I enjoy. So I'm always just trying to look to tweak and attack the meta game from a different angle. And this feels like just the perfect environment to do that in in most formats. It's wild for me to hear that you felt like you weren't much of a brewer before a year ago or so, because you were very prolific. I feel like I feel like it's 
con- like a constant stream of ideas of new decks kind of come out with what you're playing on a weekly basis and what I see you talking about. So that is wild to think about what might happen. Well, I've, I've really year. only been doing this for a year. So maybe the, the stream of time in this uh, COVID world is distorted, but you know, before I, I did, I did brew and like I, the blue red Phoenix deck was like my first big deck in modern, but uh, besides that, I would just try to play the best deck and I'd try to uh, try to just tune it and tweak it just a little bit every week. That's awesome. How about you, Dave? I mean, you know, I'm at the extreme opposite end, right? Like I am not a brewer. I'm someone who's looking to pick up something that I can try to do well in a league with on the two or three times a week that I get to play a league. Um, And so that's how I end up playing Luris Shadow because it's a shell I already understand or prowess because I like aggro decks or things like that. And so I mostly will try to play one of the decks in the meta in this situation, just pick it up, try to do my best with it, and then move on to whatever's more interesting next month for mana traders. Also, just as part of like making the podcast, like I want to make sure I know the top couple of decks in the metagame pretty well at a given point in time. So, um, yeah, I try to go with the flow. I'm not a, I'm not a brewer. And, um, for now it's just, what's the best Luris deck is kind of what I'm trying to play. So the question is, what's our tendency in metas like this? I don't know if I've ever experienced a metagame quite like this. So all I can really do is speak to what I'm playing now. And that's a variety of decks that exist in this cross section of strategies I enjoy that also give me a chance at having some deck advantage over some opponents. So, I mean, I don't think you're asking specifically what decks I'm playing, but I've I've still been playing some amount of Gruel Aggro, aka Obosh Panza, just because I really like that deck and I still think Clothis is fantastic. I actually think Clothis is quite good against some of these Lura strategies, especially. I mean, Magus of the Moon is not bad against some of these Urion decks too, especially when you can back it up with a Pillage to destroy their Astrolabes, which is a pretty weird exchange, but you kind of have to do it. But yeah, I kind of just like, I've been brewing less than ever, but I don't think that's because of Companions. I think that actually has more to do with the pandemic and just not being able to play Paper Magic. I'm sort of interacting with this game in a very different way, and it's less about a creative itch and it's becoming more about like a the podcast and b just trying to like stay involved with the game also quite honestly i don't know if i could brew effectively in a in a meta like this just because i don't know if my grasp on some of these luris and yorion strategies is nearly as good as some of like the decks that i brewed in the past you know when i used to mess around with blue red decks and try to find original spins on that it's because i had a ton of experience with with blue moon style control decks yeah, a lot of these sort of they feel like like value decks and like value engines and capitalizing on decks like that, I feel historically have always been challenging for me at least. Like playing playing an Obzon deck back when Obzon was a thing, or like playing a Jun deck, it's it's like you know, really eking out small values. And I think that these cards, while they seem like they're sort of win buttons, I think when everyone's playing the win buttons, it's about who's using them in a smarter and more in superior way over the course of many, many, many turns, which is somewhat rare for ma- for a modern, at least I think. And I, you know, typically I'm, I'm just not smart enough to, to game the meta. And so I'm like going to play what I know or like what seems like the best deck that I'm going to like playing. That's kind of what I usually gravitate towards, right? Like what, what's proactive that's going to do well that I'm going to try to have some fun with Shane. Are there any decks right now that you actively like playing? That's a good question, Stan. In a uh, man, like I was, I really was looking forward to playing humans in our in our um, podcast league, and I just felt like I didn't have a lot of game right now. I think, I mean, I'm looking at the the Rakdos Prowess deck. I mean, I did like playing uh, Burn in Pioneer, I liked that quite a bit. And this this Rakdos Prowess deck, I, I have always, you know, historically, I've liked playing hand disruption because those decisions are really important and those decisions are really meaningful. And so you can, you can pin a lot. Like you, sometimes when I, when I in paper, if I'm disrupting someone's hand, I'm like going to be like, look, I'm going to take some time here because this is the decision that I know is going to like basically win me the game or not. So bear with me. My other ones will be a lot faster. And being able to do that with hand disruption in this, the Rakdos deck looks appealing. 
be able to make those decisions while still being aggressive, I think is pretty cool and trying to eke out value with, with Luris and, and, uh, kind of the recursion engine that exists with that. And also kind of with unearth and stuff from the sideboard definitely looks appealing. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to be metagamed against heavily though in a league. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, do you just base level ever? Do you think that deck's going to hang around for a little bit? The Rakdos deck specifically? Um, yes, I think for a little bit. I think that it or Boros may be the better call for any given weekend. I also think that I think that Sprite Dragon is really, really good. <laughs> and we might see a, an Is It version exist. I was playing that with uh, Death Shadow and Dreadhorde Arcanist, actually. And it was like reasonably good. Like I had a couple of really awkward times with it, but um, it was interesting. It's definitely a powerful card. I think it's, this is kind of interesting because I think what I just did is sort of reveal a potential weakness and hole in, in my game and a strength in yours ever, which is like, I'm, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to respond to what looked cool and did well this last week. And then, you know, are you someone who's like, I think people are going to respond to that and be playing it. So what can I do to, to level level two them level three of them? Uh, not usually. I actually think that, I usually like to play at level two. I like to play, you know, as to what people are, you know, doing at a given time. And, you know, I do a lot of brewing and I don't brew necessarily just because I enjoy it. I do. But I think brewing in every good brew that exists comes out because you figured out a specific card or interaction that is well positioned in the meta. So like with the mono green walkers deck, Karn the Great Creator was really well positioned in Pioneer. That was the best shelf for it. Nobody else had tried it before. With the blue-white counterbalance deck, counterbalance was really well positioned. Nobody realized it. And it was, you know, good for the is it, you know, it was it's still good, I think. Um and, and so that's what you have to do if you want to brew, if you want to next level, you have to try to find something that people aren't doing and is good against what the people are doing. So you can't say, I really like Esper Charm, which is really the card <laughs> that people ask me the most about. Is it <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. People always say, can I, can we play Esper for Esper Charm? And as much as, as much as like, it hurts me to say no, <laughs> like, like for, for control decks specifically and for these interactive decks, which I like to play, you don't, brew them because you you love this one specific card and you just want to build around a card you love. And there's a place and time for that in magic. And magic is about enjoying it. If you're not enjoying playing a deck, I don't rem- I don't I do not recommend anybody ever play a deck they don't enjoy. But brewing is not about brewing around a card you love on a competitive level. It's about finding a card that is well positioned in a format in a metagame and building around that that interaction. Um, but again Really, people ask me all the time, I want to get into modern. What's the best way to do it? And people in chat usually say, I want to, you should play Burn or Tron because those are easy to get into. But I, I disagree. I think what you should do is look at decks, find the one that looks cool to you, and just lose and lose and lose until you start winning with it and just play what you enjoy and what looks good to you and looks fun. Because this is a game. I think ultimately your enjoyment is the thing that matters the most. And if you're not enjoying, I, I don't think the game is worth playing. Hey, speaking of counterbalance, Everett, how does it feel that uh, it's thirty dollars again because of you? It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> this is like the second or third time a card has increased in price because of one of my brews. Uh, it's pretty sweet. Have, have you been buy? Do you buy them first? Uh, I do not. Uh, sorry, I I did buy three counterbalances because I rented them for Mana Traders, and three of them were the Invocation Arts. Um, I, I I always I always disclose when I buy cards and brewing around. It feels kind of it would feel dishonest to not do so. Um, I've bought Car and the Great Creators for like five dollars a piece, and I think that card has potential to go up still. But no, I, I don't really buy cards I brew around usually. So we're here to talk about companions, and we're here to talk about existing in the world where companions exist in. And we just talked about counterbalance. I feel like maybe we could go forward to talk about like conceptually kind of breaking down the individual companions a little bit. And, and, you know, part of the reason I was excited to have you on too, is to maybe help guide us through some of the kind of implications that these individual cards have on the metagame right now. So I, I feel like let's, let's jump to Luris and talk about that because I know the tweet where you first tweeted out this counterbalance deck said, I think this is a great deck for magic, the Lurising, Right. And so I thought that was, interesting. And I think, you know, people have impressions about that. For me, 
just to break it down, it feels like Luris is really easy to use, but Luris needs a few different things to be good. And so in my mind, Luris needs a graveyard to get cards out of. Luris needs things that have low CMCs. And often Luris benefits from casting multiple spells a turn. Are there other kind of interactions that you feel like people should keep an eye on at that kind of like 10,000 foot level that we should be aware of for what Luris needs to be successful in a shell? So I think for mid-range decks and control decks, uh, you know, John, Grixis, Jeskai, Luris, you need a way to generate card advantage with Luris. And modern, that is Mistress Bobble and Pioneer. That's Unbridled Growth or Soul Guide Lantern. I think that if Mistress Bobbles is banned, if you are using one or two mana to cantrip every turn with Luris, the card gets a lot worse. Um, but, you know, because Luris can be, can have cheap one-for-ones with the graveyard with cards like Nihil Spellbomb, Seal of Fire, uh, but also be card advantage, that's that's usually what makes Luris so powerful is that that versatility, and it really is is your engine. So that that's what I would look out for is cards that generate card advantage more so than than threats. Great point. And so when you were starting to look at the counter, counterbalance deck in the context of Luris, was it really all about the fact that you kind of know what CMC spells are important to people? Or what do you think was the seed of interaction that made that deck successful? Well, I, I've got a I've got a shout out uh, Red Headband who said, "Hey, I think that you know maybe counterbalance is good at the moment." Paid me forty dollars to build around it. I agreed. Uh, you know, it's it's let's so it's less so specific CMCs and more so just that converted mana costs are lower, games are going longer, more spells are being cast, people aren't trying to kill you on turn three right now, and counterbalance can just sit and play and counter your opponent's spells. But the more and more I'm playing with the deck. Omen of the Sea and Mystic Sanctuary alongside Jace the Mind Sculptor are really, really powerful with counterbalance. Just your opponent casts a spell and you fetch and you Mystic Sanctuary and you put whatever CMC spell your opponent's casting on top. It is a very powerful interaction. And I actually think if Luris or Bobble goes, the Miracles deck will be here to stay. Wow. Now that's a call. I, I, I love that though, because that's, you know, we talked about before, this is the shell of cards that a lot of people have affinity for and just like it never quite made it in modern. And maybe it's just because people felt like it wasn't going to make it because top wasn't around or something like that. But you're right. There's a lot of different spells that do scry effects. There's Jace, Mystic Sanctuary is obviously an exploitable card and tons of different things. So I think that's awesome. Also, quick question about counterbalance. I've noticed you mostly been playing it as uh, with Kahira uh, as your companion, just because Kahira is free. Do you see this ever being a Yarion deck? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, something I get asked a lot, actually. One thing I will say, Kahira is really not a big deal in the deck. If I ever felt like I wanted to play Snapcaster, Monastery, Mentor, Vendillion, Click, and currently I don't, but if I ever felt like I wanted to for a particular metagame, I would not lose any sleep about cutting Kahira. Kahira is nice to have, what it does the most is it lets you have a win condition to cast while you're already going off with Jace and Counterbalance, but you're winning that game 99% of the time anyways. Um, just like you know the, the punching in the face while you have him in the headlock. And you just can't run Celestial Colonnade because it sucks these days, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sadly, Mystic Sanctuary just pushes Colonnade out, but it would get buffed by Kahira. Um, but as far as Yorion goes... I think that there is a counterbalance Yorion control deck. I've seen some people trophying with it. I know Gabriel Nassif has been working on it. I do not like it in the blue-white shell specifically um, with Terminus. I think that because uh, it almost feels like you can't play Yorion without Arkham's Astrolabe. And I think Arkham's Astrolabe plays very poorly with Terminus. It also doesn't help you set up your counterbalance. But just specifically sorcery speed cantrips that only draw one card. And if you just Astrolabe draw a miracle... It's awkward. It's not something you want to do. I also want to play counterbalance on turn two every single game. I I think it is the best card in the in the in the in the deck. And eighty cards, you will see it less often. And I, we have seen that that downside is not as realized as Magic players may think. But I don't think the blue white version wants to play Yorion. I think that there are Jeskai and Bant decks that can be built and be very grindy. But that's not really the decks I tend to gravitate towards, anyways. So real quick, just to play back what you said about why counterbalance is working right now, it's not so much about that it interacts with exactly what Luris is doing, specifically like a single Luris. It's more that it interacts well with the conditions that the Luris decks are causing in the metagame, which is 
everybody has lower CMC spells. And because the decks are interactive, because they have to kill each other's creatures, the games are going long. Is that kind yes. of fair? Yeah, that, that, that's what I was trying to say. Because counterbalance, it, it blind flips. It will just sit and play, and it will you know answer two or three cards over the course of the game if you play it on turn two, whether or not you manipulate the top of your library or not. And especially when your opponents are just trying to outgrind, do you play cheap interactive spells? And it's yeah, it's, it's less so against the Luris decks necessarily, but more so about the environment that Luris is cultivating. So Dave, you kind of, you handed out this concept that I think we we should revisit here. And then we've been talking a lot about Yorion. So maybe it makes sense to kind of talk about like what makes Yorion good and what makes Yorion bad? Like what, what are the weaknesses of Yorion decks that we can try to exploit or players who want to exploit a Yorion metagame should be doing? Well, one is forcing them to play to their sideboard. Yeah, because they have, they have an 80 card main, main, and so you're not going to get your sideboard as often, which is something that Everett mentioned earlier, for sure. Like, Yorian decks can't really get surgical. I, I think before we actually go into this, I think we should also mention that we were influenced a little bit in this concept by an SCG article that Ari lacks wrote uh, just this past week. And so, you know, we're not trying to crib from it, but it definitely uh, helped us out in thinking about some weaknesses of companions. He talked, you know, he talked about many different formats, but in Pioneer and Modern, there were some good ideas here. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, when I look at Yorian just as a card and try to break down what it needs to be successful, the same way I was trying with Luris, it's like, you got to have permanence in play for it to blink. Like, that's the number one thing. And those permanents have to draw cards. The second thing is, you have to have the time to get to a five CMC card. And then the last thing is the large deck requirement. Everett, do you think there's anything that's kind of off that list as far as things Yorian needs to be successful? Um, nothing off that list. Maybe I do think that Yorian decks tend to be better when they play tutors. I, you know, I've had a lot of success in Court of Calling, Yorian shells, Scapeshift, Bring to Light shells tend to be good Yorian decks. And just a lot of times decks with Court of Calling, Bring to Light, they have cards that they want to play but can't quite fit in 60 cards. And I, I think also mana bases get way better when they're 32 lands in modern because of fetch lands. I found that my Yorion mana bases are better than any other mana base I have in, in other decks. Just because you can you can you get to play like these triomes and you draw them less often and it's really smooth. You just get to fetch them and get the three mana, the three colors. Just to like put a finer point on why Yorian wants to play with tutors, it's because you want to have some mechanism to tutor up a card with a specific uh comes into play ability so that when you play Yorian, you get the double pull off of it, kind of. Is that why? Well, it, it it adds a consistency to an eighty card deck that may struggle with the consistency otherwise. Um, while at the same time, you get to play, you get to fit cards in your deck you might not otherwise get to. I think less often you're tutoring up value engines because you already have built your deck around the value engine with astrolabes and like omens, and so more often you're tutoring up your interactive spells. That's what I've been doing in my uh, soul herder avalanche rider Yorion deck. Do you think it's ever advantageous to sort of, you know, like Dave mentioned that Yorion's a five drop, but in some slower decks, if they're forced to interact with you, they're not being able to play permanence to the board because they have to slow down an aggressive strategy. Like it's not always going to get you a lot of value on turn five beyond, you know, maybe a single card draw and you get the Sarah Angel out of it. But how how slow does Yorian have to play sometimes before it can actually play play the the card to the board and get value out of it it's kind of an i mean it's obviously matchup dependent and and very contextual um but i i i uh, I do think that you have identified that the yori index they play slower they have like cards that are generating a lot of value and they you know interact with you know you know kind of softer cards like you know lightning bolt remand is it charm and they're just kind of trying to buy time until they overvalue you with with value um, which is kind of the opposite of Luris decks, which are just trying to grind you into the dust with as cheap interactive spells as possible, and then just play their Luris when you when you're already out of cards and win with Luris's advantage. So they they play very differently, and the, and the fact that both exist at the same time is is really ish, interesting to how to see how the various you know Yorion Luris decks clash, and then it's uh, we've talked this to death, but uh, those are the those are the two different gameplay patterns. 
what do you think? I think there's kind of like an entry level Luris player like me that would kind of be like, well, I can play Luris here and I can maybe get a card of value out of it from the graveyard. Do you think that there is a, a thought process that people should keep in the back of their mind for like how a, a good player would play against them uh, with a Luris deck? I mean, I know that's like a super like, generic question, but like, what, what do you think like, you're saying that people can get a lot of edge with their skill what do you think the skillful elements of playing with Luris is? I, I, I think that Luris is incredibly skill intensive because knowing when to go for it is not only matchup contextual, but it's also contextual in individual games. It is like sometimes just often correct to jam Luris on turn three in a matchup where your opponent has a ton of removal. If they're stumbling and you have a bobble and you know that they're already stumbling and they need to use their mana to react to you. If you have unearths in your deck and you can get value off your Luris, you, and especially if you have unearth in your hand, you want to play Luris super aggressively. If it's a matchup where usually whoever gets to stick their Luris wins, you will want to hold your Luris and make them use their interactive spells on like your Swift Spears and Soul Scar Mages. And then when they're out of ammo, that's when you play your Luris. And so I, I think it varies from matchup to matchup. It varies from game to game. And that's why it's skill intensive. Can I just pause really quick and comment on how elegantly Everett is able to answer all these questions? It's as if you've thought about them already. And I don't know if you have. And it's just like, I love talking to players at your level because you just think about the game in such a more holistic way. It, I'm just always impressed whenever I'm watching your stream or whenever you're on the pod. I, I get these questions a lot, so I actually spend a lot of time talking about the like this, these same things. So I've already, oh, I've already, I've already articulated a lot of this stuff and formulated my arguments and how I feel and think about it. I see ahead of time, I guess. I see. So it wasn't as elegant the first time. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can ask. You can ask my chat. I've been stumbling around <laughs> it until I formed a coherent argument. So why are people listening to to this podcast, Everett? Because our listeners are busy at work <laughs> while Everett's streaming. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough, we'll, fair get, we'll get the rehash stuff. So before we get off of Yorian, if you felt like you had to pick a deck to just beat a bunch of Yorian decks right now, where where are you going with that in your mindset? In Pioneer, I'd play Lotus Breach. I feel like if you are an expert Lotus Breach player, you're going to crush the Yorian decks. In Modern, I think Blue Red Storm probably has an excellent matchup against uh, a lot of these Yorian strategies. It, it obviously varies from Yorian deck to Yorian deck, but usually you want a linear deck, like a Titan deck, a Tron deck, combo deck. That's that's usually the matchups that beat up on Yorian, and that's also usually the matchups that Luris beats up on. So you kind of have, in some ways, a triangle in, uh, in Pioneer and Modern. Do we want to talk about a couple of the less, uh, less popular companions for a minute? Yeah, sure. I love casting Obosh. I was going to say Stan is an, an Oboshman these days. Ever right. since we did a, a dive down on Ponza about a month ago, you know, for me when I think about like the constraints of Obosh, it's it's a couple things. It, it needs some setup because it needs to have permanence in play that can attack, and you need some extra mana to cast a spell maybe occasionally when it comes into play. Uh, sometimes I wonder if you want to cast Obosh when you're ahead on board. So that's why I always wonder if it's like. Uh, really about closing more so than stabilizing uh, with Obosh, but open to what everybody else thinks Obosh is good at doing or what it needs to do to be successful. I agree. I mean, whenever I play it in Ponza, I always think it's kind of what I'm ramping up to because I know that once I have Obosh out, finishing that game becomes so much easier. Like, especially if I could do like a turn two Clothis, turn three Obosh, because I have access to like four mana really fast on turn two and, you know, Clothis gets me some some extra mana on top of that. It feels like Obosh just being such a must-answer threat that's also quite hard to kill. It makes every other card in that deck punch harder. Yeah, Obosh reminds me of, of Yorion in the way that it requires setup. Like, you know, Obosh by, by itself, of course, is a little bit scary, but really you have to build a board, retain that board, 
and then be able to take advantage of the damage you're putting through. And it's not like it doubles the power and toughness either. So there's kind of like, there's counters to it where you can't just immediately be swinging in for damage, but you're at the point, typically if you have got a board where you might have some sandbag burn going to the face and you've gotten some chip damage in, or you've made them chump block and your next attack is a lot more lethal. But yeah, it kind of in the same way, it's like, you know, you can't just play Obosh and it's going to generate a ton of value for you on its own. Yeah. And and admittedly, I haven't tried any of these mono red decks in Pioneer that play Obosh on turn five. I have to assume he's still good, especially if you've established a board state, but I'm just so used to getting him out ahead of curve. I saw a really, really sweet Obosh deck that actually is not playing Obosh as their game one companion. They play... Oh, I love this and deck. Eight, the, the eight, so it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a Yorion deck that can't cast Yorion. It's 80 cards. It reveals Yorion. And so your opponents will often mulligan to you know more slow, grindy hands. And then you're just a mono red deck that sides out 14 cards in games two and three. And one of those cards is Obush. I don't know if it's good. It's probably not. But it's one of the most creative examples of deck building I've ever seen. And I think we've seen a lot of things like that with companions. I really, really liked it. That sounds like a very genuine transformative sideboard. <laughs> yeah. The meme Stan, is real. Stan's dream. It was really cool. Let me see if I can get the, the guy's name because I just thought it was super, super innovative. I His name is his name is Baker Ninan. Uh, really, really cool. Just like awesome idea. Loved it. Beautiful. So what are you what are you thinking about in terms of I mean, I know that it's it's a Yorion and uh, Luris metagame. But when you're when you're fighting against an Obosh deck, like what are you trying to do typically? So I think usually decks with lots of removal control decks are usually pretty good against Obosh decks. I will say that Obosh, I think, exemplifies one, a, a gameplay pattern that Wizards was maybe more so thinking companions would embody when they first printed them in that it's a five mana creature that doesn't impact the board. And while is card advantage is vulnerable to two mana removal spells and you can get tempoed out. And I do think in a lot of ways, Magic in the past year or so has been more so about tempo than card advantage. And I think that the intention of Companion was to kind of like maybe mitigate that a little bit. And so if you can play a three mana threat and hold up, a, you know, a heartless act and kill a boosh, then you are getting ahead on, on board on tempo. If you can get, draw cards with your three mana threat, that's another way to fight it. And and, you know, that is also kind of realized against decks that play Jagatha, decks that play play Zerta, if you can answer Zerta for one mana, you can get ahead on tempo. It, it, the same thing is also true for Luris. If you can answer Luris for one mana, you can just get ahead on tempo if you still have the gas to finish your opponent and push your advantage. Yeah, I love that about, you know, Luris matchups is that Shock does it. I feel like we should mention Zerta at least briefly because unlike Jengatha, it's another build-around companion. And it's never one that you put into your sideboard just because of it being a free spell. Unless you're playing blue white control and pioneer, then uh, I've seen some people just like, like they just don't play seal away and they just have Zerda for free. Um, but yes, yes. Yeah. And, and ultimately I think she's a permanent based companion similar to Obosh in that way where you kind of want to set up a board state. I've been seeing her either in the combo shells, which, which is what uh, we were doing in modern at first. And then the cycling deck in pioneer is she elsewhere in either of those formats that I'm not listing off? Uh, I think I think you covered it. Yeah, because she's banned in Legacy now. Right, and I feel like in both those cases, interaction is is key. Like mid range decks are really great, not only at picking apart combo pieces maybe from an opponent's hand, but even removing some of these creatures that help set up a combo along the way. Yeah, I think Zerda and Garuda, both of these decks, build around me cards, and often if you can just kill the Zerda or counter the Garuda. Their deck is really weak and kind of falls apart. I've I've experienced. I think actually both Garuda and Zerda they do really cool things, but your opponent reveals it immediately. You know exactly what's going on, and you can find a counter spell or a removal spell. The Garuda one. I played the Garuda deck in both Pioneer and Modern a couple weeks ago, and I was like, not very impressed with the way that they play out. Just because there's a lot, it's a lot of clones, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of clones doing doing not, <laughs> not much else. All right. Well, I think now that we've come to the end of the discussion here about individual companions, do we want to have like some called shots about what we think is going to happen given we just threw, went through 
the metagame that we talked about and the banned and restricted update that happened yesterday. I mean, what's everybody's guts on where things are going to go from here? Shane? Hmm. Well, can, can we ask it this way, Dave? Like, I kind of I kind of want to give Dom the shout out here, right? Because he was sort of saying if you had to play both sides, like if you had to be pro companion and anti companion, like why would you want to keep companions and the mechanic the same? And might why why might you want to change it? And I guess I can I think that concept can inform what what we think might happen. Um, Dom is a member of the Dive Down Nation. He is in the super secret Slack server all the time. He's one of our our, our staple patrons. So thanks, Dom, for this great question. Um, so I, I'll go first. Sure, why not? Um, keeping companion cards and mechanic the same. Well, I think I, I like Everett's argument. I'm just going to steal it from him, which is I think that it, it leads to these cards are very powerful in terms of, you know, all the companion, many of the companions are powerful. Many of them have, you know, Zerda has some awesome combo ability. Obosh is a great for an, an ag- aggressive player. Uh, we have Yorion for control and long game strategies. We have Lyris for a number of different strategies, whether those are aggressive or creature combo oriented or uh, disruptive. And so I think that that that's cool, right? So they they made something that almost you know seventy five percent perhaps of the combined modern and pioneer metagame are using. In that way, it's a success. <laughs> it, so they they made cards that are seeing play, and that's very good. Unfortunately, I think that they might not have wanted uh, Ilob to be seen as the companion set. You know, no one's playing mutate. No one's playing their the the giant beefy monsters. They're all you know. It's 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 broadly the companion set. So you know, there there's a reasoning there, right? It's like people in the meta game is shifting. Things are changing. People are responding to things. Uh, it's dynamic, uh, and so that's the reason for keeping things the same. And before I talk about maybe why they might change it, um, let's maybe let's talk about if there's any, any things I'm missing or, or nuances that I overlooked. I think you've laid it down pretty well, like what people are generally feeling and like what the possibilities are. So what I mean, about it's fun. Wait, wait. Changing I would just it, say I, I have this really hard time closing the gap between I'm having fun playing these decks, right? And then what we're about to say with what would be our reasons for changing it. It's like my heart says one thing and my brain says another thing when I sit down and look at the results and what what I'm seeing. You know what I think it is? I've never played against any of these companion decks and felt truly hopeless. Unlike an Oko meta or Hogak meta, sometimes you, or, or KCI for that matter, once upon a time, remember that deck? Sometimes you sit across these strategies and it's just like, there's nothing I can do. All of my interaction sucks. It's like I picked the wrong deck for the month. And it never really feels that way. You know, when Yurion gets ahead, it's because their control plan worked out and they'd just been playing control and they got to turn five. And that's when control gets ahead anyway. You know, when Lurus gets ahead, it's because you couldn't remove one of their creatures, but if your creature dies to shock, like that doesn't feel so bad. And and I think that may be part of what maybe Dave you're experiencing where these games are fun because they're still games and the quote unquote non games that sometimes people refer to in this meta has more to do with the fact that these games just are so similar from one another, you know, over time. Yeah. And let me say one other thing. One, one other thing that I think makes these interactive from a strategic level that we've talked about a bunch of times is just the idea of, um, I do know one thing my opponent is going to do in their game. And so I can try to plan ahead to respond to the one thing that I know for sure they're going to do this, this game. Maybe, you know, it depends on what shell it's in. It depends on when they're going to play it, but all those things, like it provides this sort of like single kernel of information that lets me put together a game plan that I have some agency in, you know what I mean? And so. So you're saying it's a pro. I, it's really hard. Like, I think there are parts of it that are a pro. Yeah, I, I think so too. And I, I don't want to downplay the downsides of Companion, but I, I think I've been maybe upplaying so much of it just because of all the negativity I've seen, uh, I, you know, on, on Twitter and in Twitch chat and stuff. But I, I'm actually pretty pro Companion. I think that Yorion and Luris are probably a little too pushed and we'll probably see you know, one or two of them banned in a lot of constructed formats. 
But as far as eradicating Companion, I, I think that if you just banned Luris and Yorion, Companion would just be fine as is. So I probably would rather see that happen. Uh, you know, a ban of Luris and Yorion rather than uh, a changing of the mechanic. We kind of talked about this, I think, two episodes ago, Everett, and I'll kind of ask you the same question. But what do you think Watsi's long-term plans are for a companion and like do you see a world in which they continue to make companions and they're just powerful enough to to warrant building around and they're always kind of at the peripheral and sometimes you're like oh cool you know this person's on a companion deck how do you think they can balance it long term to make them playable but not busted given kind of the innate card advantage built into them uh, I don't think they necessarily have plans to print a ton more companions. The probably just doesn't really feel like that. It kind of seems like they wanted this to be a unique thing. And I I do think that Wizards, and this is something that we've been seeing a lot lately, Wizards seems they want to be printing cards that are going to reduce the amount of games that end in mana flood. It's almost impossible to uh, print cards that stop you from getting mana screwed, but you can kind of hedge against that because if you play cards with mana sinks, like Ur- like Urza, Uro, Imri. Card in the Great Creator. Yeah, Card in the Great Creator. Cards that just that you keep going and going and always have something to do with your mana in Companion. These mechanics, they fix one of Magic's biggest problems is that the game is great when both players get to play the game, but as percentage of the time, the fact is you flood out or you get mana screwed. And so... It seems to me their intention is to stop that and make the game better because of it. And I think that that is ultimately a good thing. They've been pretty vocal about their intentions to increase the overall power level of the game. Not so much as a ramp, but they kind of have a new bar for what they want threats to be. And I think that with every set that's coming out, you know, we, we've seen like how crazy was Uro, how crazy was Oko, how crazy was, you know, you know Mystic Sanctuary Urza. But as all these things are coming out, they're all feeling a little more balanced because people are starting to each have a new toy to play with, a new really powerful card to play. And I think that as time goes on, these crazy cards will seem more fair because they have a, a, a bar that they're that they're setting. So I want to give you some time. We want to you know have some Everett's promo zone. Let's let's quickly talk about why they might change the mechanic. Or why they might, you know, ban some specific command. I think we talked about why they might ban some specific companions due to their power level. But why do you think they might change the mechanic on a fundamental level? All right. So I withheld this opinion when we discussed the BNR at the top. But when I read that article this week on Monday, I actually think they just showed their hand and changing the mechanic as a ruling is inevitable at this point. Inevitable. I think so. Okay. I, I I agree that that's where their mind is. Um, I I also think it's possible that that's the right call to make. Companion is it's su- it's super hard. It, like even someone that thinks about this all day every day, I really don't know what to do. I don't like I know what I would suggest to do, but I could see maybe writing companion is the best way to go. And and the point you made earlier, ever about how there's no reminder text next to the rule. I don't know. Part of me wonders if that was by design. If they knew that this is really powerful, we're impacting opening hands in a very profound way. Why not keep the door open in a way that we could only ever do with digital card games, but now actually exists on paper as well? Maybe. I, 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 I think probably not, but there's a possibility that that's the case. Yeah. I mean, I, as for as much as I said, like I said, the, the last question, it's like this head and heart thing, right? My brain, every time I look at these cards, I go, they can't let 40% of people have eight cards and 60% of people have seven cards in their opening hands. It just, it just can't go on forever. And so I think that whether it makes these cards unplayable or not, I think is real world would remain to be seen. But I do think there's a, I do think that you have to address that disparity in kind of card advantage uh, just because it's so there. It's so squarely and like unequivocally there. And I think I think fundamentally people don't want the the samey gameplay. Like I think you know this this kind of gets to that classic like the pros love the mirrors and the great players love the mirrors because they can exploit their skill over a long period of time. But you know ninety eight percent of the players are probably like, man, if I see one more 
freaking Luris, I'm going to flip out. If I see one more Yorian deck, I'm going to flip out. Like I, I want to see a, a, a wider range of cards, you know, whether or not the decks are the same or, or different. It's the fact that you, you know, you always know it's coming. And Dave says that it can be seen as a pro and in a lot of ways, I think people could see that as a, as a con, like they don't want that same gameplay every game. So this isn't exactly related, but it just makes me think of a common point in the discourse, which is that modern is becoming a rotating format. And I'm not saying that we should consider dealing with companions because of that potentially being true. I'm kind of curious, Everett, do you agree with that? Uh, I think that is probably a little disingenuous to call modern a rotating format. But I understand the idea that, you know, modern exists so people can play the same deck for years and years. That was like the initial idea. And I think that is a totally fine way to enjoy magic. I think that is a totally fine way to approach the game. And that's the reality of a, like how most people play modern is they have a deck they really like. They want it to always be kind of viable. Um, me personally, that's not how I enjoy to play modern. I enjoy modern when it's different and it's always changing. That suits my needs as a player, as someone who's streaming constantly. Modern gets boring if it's, you know, constantly the same decks. It, um, and so I don't think anybody's wrong to, to say, uh, you know, I don't like this because, you know, my deck isn't good anymore. And it's just like, I'm not wrong to say, I like that it's changing, just personal preference. Which is why I feel like we've seen Wizards take a, a ban list approach that is less so about feel bad moments. Like they're not banning Neo Brand, you know, they're not banning decks that they think are unhealthy for the format because so many people seem to be so polarized on what is and isn't working that it seems like they just need to be banning cards based on win percentage of particular decks. And I think that. Right now, while the community is so polarized on like what is or is not working, that's just the best way to do it. All right. Well, I think kind of ties up our extensive discussion on companions, part 17, part the 17. Right, see you next week for part 18. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> ever, ever, we'll we'll send the dinner to your house. We'll all eat, eat and talk together, uh, uh -huh. social distancing. Um, Everett, before we head into the wind down for some listener questions for you, I wanted to uh, let you have some time to talk about Talk about full-time streaming. Talk about your decision to become a full-time streamer. Um, maybe give some you know, reasons for doing so. What do you think content creators should you know, consider before trying to take that plunge? Some of your goals in the coming months? Sure. Um, you know, becoming a full-time streamer had been a goal of mine for a long time. You know, it's something I've been grinding very hard to achieve. It's not something I thought was going to happen anytime soon. I was starting to think that it would happen at some point. And then I was laid off uh, earlier this month. They asked me to stay on for a couple weeks, um, but my position was being eliminated. Mm. And I was just kind of talking about it on chat. And the support for me going full time was pretty overwhelming. I blew past the sub goal I wanted to achieve streaming full time. And I've just been, you know, coated in a warm blanket of support. And it's been great. Yeah, that's 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 surprising. That's you know, it's not, almost not surprising, right? It's kind of amazing when you're just like the the community. I think wants to support content creators. We've felt it. It's been awesome to see you see it and experience it. You know, we're here to support you as well. That's what we wanted to have you on, uh, partially because you're awesome, but also because you know we want to feature you. You're an awesome member of the community. Um, so, what do you think? What do you think you want to be doing with streaming over in the next few months, next year? So I've you know increased my stream schedule from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time every weekday. I also am planning on playing like a Saturday Sunday tournament every weekend. But the main goal is to just continue to innovate in mostly modern and pioneer to continue to brew. I am qualified for the PT. I qualified for the PT on the stream, which was such a wonderful moment to share with the stream. Who had like you know, just pushed me towards full time content creation, and it was it was it was really really uh, wholesome. And so. I, I plan to continue to stay on the PT. You know, that had been something that's taken a a uh, kind of a sideline role. But now that I'm back on, I'm going to try to stay on. So if I, uh, you know, next season, I'm going to be grinding the PTQs really hard is the goal and just kind of see where it takes me. Um, I as, as far as like, this kind of ties into the advice for other people trying to get into content creation and streaming. I think hard and firm goals are 
not always healthy. I think that what is healthy is like a, you know, a schedule and a little bit structured to what you're putting out. But as far as the actual stuff that you're putting out, magic is a game that changes so often that it's hard to commit to one thing because something is going to pop up or you might have an idea. And I tend to just, you know, play whatever I'm feeling like playing and working on whatever I feel like working on. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to stream something, if you're going to throw your ideas out there, you have to be interested and passionate. I think that if you want to get into streaming specifically, uh, what you should do is find uh, a particular role you feel you fill. If you're an expert at a deck, if you're really, really good at it, showcase that you're good at it. Showcase that you have ideas to share. If you're really good at brewing, brew. If you're good at playing limited, play limited. Do what you're good at. And if you're good at it, people will show up and watch you. Do you think you will primarily stream Magic or is there any chance that you might stream other games? I, I do stream Dark Souls from time to time. Uh, uh, every time uh, Magic Online is under maintenance, I've streamed Dark Souls. I completed a no death run of Dark Souls 1 on stream uh, a couple months ago. It's it's almost always going to be Magic, unless for whatever reason I just am no longer interested in the game. But I don't see that happening. I've been playing this game for like eight years and I really, really love it. And if I'm no longer interested in Magic for one reason or another, I probably just won't stream anymore. Well, I mean, we're super excited to see the engagement you've gotten. And so congrats to you on that for sure. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for having me on. You know, this, oh, I love being leaving on yet, this, man. this podcast. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just saying thanks. This isn't <laughs> goodbye. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's let's not do a break. Let's just do some questions if we have a couple of questions, Shane. Yeah, let's just we'll just head on into the, the pseudo wind down. So we uh, asked the super secret Slack server, citizens of the nation, some questions for you. So we'll start with um, one of our constant companions in the question threads, uh, Jason. He asks, has the companion mechanic felt more inspiring or more constraining for your brewing? And has this changed over time? So I think that kind of, we, we, we've hinted at this earlier, but I think it's kind of a nice direct way to ask it. Uh, inspiring, like almost 100%. I, I think Companion is one of the most interesting deck building mechanics of all time. Obviously, like the restrictions for these decks that you're building do breed the creativity, the different ways you can use them. It's been very interesting. And even a month after, I'm still like working on new decks of each of these Companions. And I, I, I think that Companion is very cool. I do think mistakes were made, but overall, I am mostly positive about the mechanic, as it's probably come off today. Can I can I ask you one question about brewing? Unless Stan, did you have a question about companion specifically? I was just going to make a stupid joke. That's that's cool. So my question is: when you think about a brew, how do how do you start? Are you like writing down on paper or? Um, it's almost entirely. It usually just starts in my head, and I'm just trying to think about what would be good what are what art people playing that would be good in this particular context and you know honestly almost all i do is think about magic so i'm usually able to just kind of think about almost entire formats at once and just kind of have a, a good mental grip on that and then eventually i start writing and i start tweaking i spend probably a few hours on my first 75 and then i usually play most of my brews off stream until I kind of have a tuned list and then I bring them to the stream. And so if you have an interesting title or a brew that you see on my channel, you'll know that it's something I've worked on, something I think is good. That's great. Jason actually had a follow-up question that I really liked. Are there any decks you want to play but are staying away from because of the metagame as it is now? Or because they can't even meet a companion requirement? Uh, that's a good question. Uh Maybe less so Dex, but more so just Liliana of the Veil. I've just, I just feel like Luris has totally kicked her out of the metagame, but I, I miss casting that card and I, I kind of am trying to find reasons to do so and I can't really think of a good reason to do so. As far as specific decks, you know, the decks I enjoy playing the most in modern are, uh, blue mid range and control decks. And those are actually incredibly, <laughs> incredibly good right <laughs> now. So I haven't felt like my particular pet decks have been you know, kicked in the butt too hard, more so that they've just had to adapt. That was a good question. That was a good question. Um, you may know what, what's, what's, uh, what's Mickey's Twitch name? Some, oh, Turtle Power. Uh, if you recognize, oh, yes, yeah, yes. Turtle Power, he's, he's a mainstay, uh, in your stream. When I pop in, he's always there. Uh, Mickey is a, he's even watched my, me stream. Yeah. Mickey's always there. He's always there. 
Uh, but Mick, Mickey's awesome, and and he gives kind of a I think an easy answer. How does it feel having the best doggy in the MTG streaming community? He says, and he gives a shout out. Love you, Athena. Uh, I mean, it, it feels great. Obviously, she genuinely is my best friend. Uh, you now spend every day together, and I don't know. She's uh, she's added a lot of structure and love to my life, and I'm very thankful for her. Yeah, pets are amazing. They sure are. You have to feed them, you know, sometimes twice a day. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. I've got to get up. I got to get out of bed. My animal will die. And I love you to death. So you guys know, I I mean, Shane and, and Stan know this, but I don't know if the listeners know this, but I have a 140 pound Bernese mountain dog that is basically like having a giant Muppet as a roommate. And it is joyful and messy and That's everything awesome. at the same time. What kind of dog is Athena? I don't think I've ever seen. Uh, she's, she's a Husky. Uh, yeah, she's, she's a really good dog. I would, I would love to have a big 140 pound dog, but my, uh, my girlfriend won't let me get ah. one that big. <laughs> Our, ours is, ours name is, uh, his name is Walter. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. He's, he's a good boy. It's like having a roommate that you need to pay for surgery. Yeah. Cause they ate a battery. Or a baby bottle, which is what he actually did. He ripped the top off of a baby bottle one time. I we had to have it removed. But anyway, anyway. Or floss in Athena's case. Oh, jeez. I like this this, this question from Travis. Um, if you had the chance to design a card, what would it be, and why, and what format would you hope it was played in? So you 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 can't you you can't use the dive down. Okay. Of course, of course. Uh, I have a I have a card. Uh, I've always wanted a blue red command. You know, they've got Kolagon's command. They've got you know Silvergar's command. Have you been listening to our podcast? I've been begging for this. I I, I you know I I have not heard you guys beg for it. But my version of the blue red command, obviously, uh, four modes. The co- ca- casting cost would be just blue red, no generic. Um, and so the four modes you can choose from, you get to choose two. You can deal one damage to any target. You can counter a spell unless its controller pays one. You can return a creature to its controller's hand, or you can discard a card, then draw a card. You get to choose two of those. Um, that's 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 what I've always wanted. I feel like it's probably fine. Uh, I um, I don't know, but I, I think I would probably play it in Modern and maybe Legacy, but it seems okay. Uh, one damage to any target, counter a spell unless they pay one, Discard a card, draw a card, and return a creature to its controller's hand. So maybe maybe creature your opponent controls, maybe just one damage to target creature. But that's that's the that's the general idea. Print it. I love this card. I would I would pre-order it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. I would ask you to sign it when I saw you at the GP. <laughs> that would be really cool if uh, Wizards listened to this and printed the card. That'd be sick. We know they listen to all of our episodes. All right, that wraps up this week's show. Thank you again, Everett, for coming back on. Everett, before we fully close out, where can people find you? Over on twitch.tv slash Aspiring Spike. Also, Aspiring Spike on Twitter and YouTube. And of course, we always have links in the show notes. Just open up the podcast episode in whatever app you use, and it's there. Sometimes we link to decks, the tournaments we talk about. It's all there. On Spotify, they completely mangle it. So good luck parsing through that. We have it on YouTube or just go to the divedown.com. The episode's right there. All the links, any link you want. But thanks, Everett. We we love having you on. I love picking your brain, bouncing ideas against you. I love when I say something and I just see you nod and it's like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I love being on. You guys are super cool. It was really nice to meet you in Arizona. I can't remember if I... If that had happened before the last time I was on or not. Um, but it was a good time. It was really, really cool. Maybe someday we'll get to play paper again together. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully we get to meet Dave in person and, and Stan. But. It was great to meet you at all this time. I've listened to a couple apps and I, I, I watch you and I uh, consume your tweets. Yeah, aren't you glad we got to go to Phoenix you know, yes. be- before this hit? Oh my gosh, it's like it sustains me. Yeah, it was. I, I, I almost didn't go and I'm really happy that I did. It was a really good time. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. If you'd like to submit a question to the podcast or pick our brain on something in Modern or Pioneer, you can tweet us at the Dive Down, all one word, or email thedivedown at gmail.com. 
I also read every Reddit comment that people make when we post our little Reddit promos on Fridays. Sometimes a little, I'm a little late to respond, but I always try to respond unless you're making fun of me. If you'd like to support the show, you can join our Patreon. We're joining at any tier. It gets you access to our super secret Slack channel. You can find that over at patreon.com slash the dive down. Also shout out to manatraders.com for sponsoring the dive down. Sign up for Mana Traders using promo code the dive down, all one word, for 15% off your first three months of renting magic online cards. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Space Blood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and follow Aspiring Spies!